Supersessionism, also called replacement theology or fulfillment theology, is a Christian doctrine which asserts that the New Covenant through Jesus Christ supersedes the Old Covenant, which was made exclusively with the Jewish people. In Christianity, supersessionism is a theological view on the current status of the Church in relation to the Jewish people and Judaism. It holds that the Christian Church has succeeded the Israelites as the definitive people of God or that the New Covenant has replaced or superseded the Mosaic Covenant. From a supersessionist's point of view, just by continuing to exist outside the church, the Jews dissent. This view directly contrasts with dual covenant theology, which holds that the Mosaic covenant remains valid for Jews. Supersessionism has formed a core tenet of the Christian churches for the majority of its existence. Christian traditions that have traditionally championed covenant theology including the Roman Catholic, Reformed and Methodist teachings of this doctrine, have taught that the moral law continues to stand, subsequent to and because of the Holocaust. Some mainstream Christian theologians and denominations have rejected supersessionism. The Islamic tradition views Islam as the final and most authentic expression of Abrahamic prophetic monotheism, superseding both Jewish and Christian teachings. The doctrine of Tarif teaches that earlier monotheistic scriptures or their interpretations have been corrupted, while the Quran presents a pure version of the divine message that they originally contained. Etymology <inaudible> 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 The word supersessionism comes from the English verb to supersede, from the Latin verb sedio, sedir, sedi, sesum, to sit, plus super, upon. It thus signifies one thing being replaced or supplanted by another. The word supersession is used by Sidney Thelwall in the title of Chapter 3 of his 1870 translation of Tertullian's Adversus Iudios. Tertullian wrote between 198 and 208 AD. The title is provided by Thelwall, it is not in the original Latin. <laughs> Christian views Many Christian theologians saw the New Covenant in Christ as a replacement for the Mosaic Covenant. Historically, statements on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church have claimed its ecclesiastical structures to be a fulfillment and replacement of Jewish ecclesiastical structures see also Jerusalem as an allegory for the Church. As recently as 1965 Vatican Council II affirmed, "...the Church is the new people of God," without intending to make "...Israel according to the flesh." The Jewish people, irrelevant in terms of eschatology see Roman Catholicism below. Modern Protestants hold to a range of positions on the topic. In the wake of the Holocaust, mainstream Christian communities began the work of undoing supersessionism. <laughs> New Testament In the New Testament, Jesus and others repeatedly give Jews priority in their mission, as in Jesus' expression of him coming to the Jews rather than to Gentiles and in Paul's formula, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Yet after the death of Jesus, the inclusion of the Gentiles as equals in this burgeoning sect of Judaism also caused problems, particularly when it came to Gentiles keeping the Mosaic Law, which was both a major issue at the Council of Jerusalem and a theme of Paul's epistle to the Galatians, though the relationship of Paul of Tarsus and Judaism is still disputed today. Paul's views on the Jews are complex, but he is generally regarded as the first person to make the claim that by not accepting claims of Jesus' divinity, known as Christology, Jews disqualified themselves from salvation. Paul himself was born a Jew, but after a conversion experience he came to accept Jesus' divinity later in his life. In the opinion of Roman Catholic ex-priest James Carroll, accepting Jesus' divinity, for Paul, was dichotomous with being a Jew. His personal conversion and his understanding of the dichotomy between being Jewish and accepting Jesus' divinity, was the religious philosophy he wanted to see adopted among other Jews of his time. However, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright argues that Paul saw his faith in Jesus as precisely the fulfillment of his Judaism, not that there was any tension between being Jewish and Christian. Christians quickly adopted Paul's views. For most of Christian history, supersessionism has been the mainstream interpretation of the New Testament of all three major historical traditions within Christianity Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Protestant. The text most often quoted in favor of the supersessionist view is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. 
in speaking of a new covenant Jer 31.31 to 32 he has made the first one obsolete topic <laughs> church fathers Many early Christian commentators taught that the Old Covenant was fulfilled and replaced superseded by the New Covenant in Christ, for instance, Justin Martyr about 100 to 165, For the true spiritual Israel are we who have been led to God through this crucified Christ. Hippolytus of Rome martyred the 13th of August 235, The Jews have been darkened in the eyes of your soul with a darkness utter and everlasting. Tertullian, c. 155 c. 240 AD. Who else, therefore, are understood but we, who, fully taught by the new law, observe these practices the old law being obliterated, the coming of whose abolition the action itself demonstrates? Therefore, as we have shown above that the coming cessation of the old law and of the carnal circumcision was declared, so, too, the observance of the new law and the spiritual circumcision has shown out into the voluntary observances of peace." Augustine 354 follows these views of the earlier Church Fathers, but he emphasizes the importance to Christianity of the continued existence of the Jewish people. The Jews, are thus by their own scriptures a testimony to us that we have not forged the prophecies about Christ." The Catholic Church built its system of eschatology on his theology, where Christ rules the earth spiritually through his triumphant Church. Like his anti-Jewish teacher, Saint Ambrose of Milan, he defined Jews as a special subset of those damned to hell, calling them, "...witness people." Not by bodily death, shall the ungodly race of carnal Jews perish, scatter them abroad, take away their strength, and bring them down, O Lord. Augustine mentioned to love the Jews but as a means to convert them to Christianity. Jeremy Cohen, followed by John Y. B. Hood and James Carroll, sees this as having had decisive social consequences, with Carroll saying, it is not too much to say that, at this juncture, Christianity permitted Judaism to endure because of Augustine. <inaudible> Roman Catholicism Supersessionism is not the name of any official Roman Catholic doctrine and the word appears in no church documents, but official Catholic teaching has reflected varying levels supersessionist thought throughout its history, especially prior to the mid-20th century. Supersessionist theology is extensive in Catholic liturgy and literature. The Second Vatican Council marked a shift in emphasis of official Catholic teaching about Judaism, a shift which may be described as a move from hard to soft supersessionism, to use the terminology of David Novak below. Prior to Vatican II, Catholic doctrine on the matter was characterized by displacement or substitution theologies, according to which the Church and its New Covenant took the place of Judaism and its Old Covenant, the latter being rendered void by the coming of Jesus. The nullification of the Old Covenant was often explained in terms of the deicide charge that Jews forfeited their covenantal relationship with God by executing the divine Christ. As recently as 1943, Pope Pius XII stated in his encyclical, Mystici Corporis Christi. By the death of our Redeemer, the New Testament took the place of the old law which had been abolished, then the law of Christ together with its mysteries, enactments, institutions, and sacred rites was ratified for the whole world in the blood of Jesus Christ, O oh, and the gibbet of his death Jesus made void the law with its decrees fastened the handwriting of the Old Testament to the cross, establishing the New Testament in his blood shed for the whole human race. At the Second Vatican Council, convened within two decades of the Holocaust, there emerged a different framework for thinking about the status of the Jews' covenant. The Declaration Nostra Aetate, promulgated in 1965, made several statements which signaled a shift away from hard supersessionist replacement thinking which posited that the Jews' covenant was no longer acknowledged by God. Retrieving Paul's language in chapter 11 of his epistle to the Romans, the Declaration states. God holds the Jews most dear for the sake of their fathers, he does not repent of the gifts he makes or of the calls he issues. Although the Church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. 
Notably, a draft of the Declaration contained a passage which originally called for the entry of that Jewish people into the fullness of the people of God established by Christ. However, at the suggestion of Catholic priest and convert from Judaism John M. Esterreicher, it was replaced in the final promulgated version with the following language, The Church awaits that day, known to God alone, on which all peoples will address the Lord in a single voice and serve him shoulder to shoulder Zeph 3 to 9. Further developments in Catholic thinking on the covenantal status of Jews were led by Pope John Paul II. Among his most noteworthy statements on the matter is that which occurred during his historic visit to the synagogue in Mainz 1980, where he called Jews the "...people of God of the Old Covenant, which has never been abrogated by God cf. Romans 11 verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. NRSV. In 1997, John Paul II again affirmed the Jews' covenantal status, this people continues in spite of everything to be the people of the covenant and, despite human infidelity, the Lord is faithful to his covenant. The post-Vatican II shift toward acknowledging the Jews as a covenanted people has led to heated discussions in the Catholic Church over the issue missionary activity directed toward Jews, with some Catholics theologians reasoning that, if Christ is the Redeemer of the world, every tongue should confess him while others vehemently oppose targeting Jews for conversion. Weighing in on this matter, Cardinal Walter Casper, then president of the Pontifical Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, reaffirmed the validity of the Jews' covenant and then continued, b. a cause as Christians we know that God's covenant with Israel by God's faithfulness is not broken Rom 11, 29, cf. 3, 4, mission understood as call to conversion from idolatry to the living and true God 1 these 1, 9 does not apply and cannot be applied to Jews. This is not a merely abstract theological affirmation, but an affirmation that has concrete and tangible consequences, namely, that there is no organized Catholic missionary activity towards Jews as there is for all other non-Christian religions. Recently, in his Apostolic Exhortation Evangelii Gaudium, 2013, Pope Francis's own teaching on the matter closely mirrored these words of Cardinal Casper. God's grace, which is the grace of Jesus Christ according to our faith, is available to all. Therefore, the Church believes that Judaism, as the faithful response of the Jewish people to God's irrevocable covenant, is salvific for them, because God is faithful to his promises. Quote, in 2011, Casper specifically repudiated the notion of «displacement» theology, clarifying that the «new covenant for Christians is not the replacement substitution, but the fulfillment of the old covenant». These statements from Catholic officials signal a remaining point of debate, wherein some adhere to a movement away from supersessionism, and others remain with a «soft» notion of supersessionism. It should be noted that fringe Catholic groups, such as the Society of St. Pius X, strongly oppose the theological developments concerning Judaism made at Vatican II and retain hard, supersessionist views. Even among mainstream Catholic groups and official Catholic teaching, elements of soft supersessionism remain. The Catechism of the Catholic Church refers to a future corporate repentance on the part of Jews. The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel, for a hardening has come upon part of Israel in their unbelief toward Jesus. Rom 1120-26, cf. Mount 23:39. The full inclusion of the Jews in the Messiah's salvation in the wake of the full number of the Gentiles. Rom 11:12-25, cf. LK 2124, will enable the people of God to achieve the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, in which God may be all in all. The Church teaches that there is an integral continuity between the covenants rather than a rupture. In the Second Vatican Council's Lumen Gentium 1964, the Church stated that God chose the race of Israel as a people and set up a covenant with them, instructing them and making them holy. However, all these things, were done by way of preparation and as a figure of that new and perfect covenant instituted by and ratified in Christ number nine. In Notes on the Correct Way to Present the Jews and Judaism 1985, the Church stated that the Church and Judaism cannot then be seen as two parallel ways of salvation and the Church must witness to Christ as the Redeemer of all. Protestant. 
Protestant opinions on supersessionism vary. These differences arise from dissimilar literal versus figurative approaches to understanding the relationships between the covenants of the Bible, particularly the relationship between the covenants of the Old Testament and the New Covenant. In consequence, there is a range of viewpoints, including Covenant theology Dual covenant theology Classical dispensationalism Progressive dispensationalism New covenant theology Covenant premillennialism Supersessionism Three prominent Protestant views on this relationship are covenant theology, new covenant theology, and dispensationalism. Extensive discussion is found in Christian views on the Old Covenant and in the respective articles for each of these viewpoints. For example, there is a section within dispensationalism detailing that perspective's concept of Israel. Differing approaches influence how the land promise in Genesis chapter 12, 15 and 17 is understood, whether it is interpreted literally or figuratively, both with regard to the land and the identity of people who inherit it. Adherence to these various views are not restricted to a single denomination though some traditions teach a certain view. Classical covenant theology is taught within the Presbyterian and Continental Reformed traditions. Methodist hermeneutics traditionally use a variation of this, known as Wesleyan Covenant Theology, which is consistent with Arminian Soteriology. In the United States, a difference of approach has been perceived between the Presbyterian Church and the Episcopal Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and the United Methodist Church, which have worked to develop a non supersessionist theology. Paul Van Buren developed a thoroughly non supersessionist position, in contrast to Karl Barth, his mentor. He wrote, the reality of the Jewish people, fixed in history by the reality of their election, in their faithfulness in spite of their unfaithfulness, is as solid and sure as that of the Gentile Church. Mormonism The Latter-day Saint movement rejects supersessionism. Jewish views Judaism rejects supersessionism, discussing the topic only as an idea upheld by Christian and Muslim theologians. While some modern Jews are offended by the traditional Christian belief in supersessionism, a different viewpoint has been offered by rabbi and Jewish theologian David Novak, who has stated that, "...Christian supersessionism need not denigrate Judaism," and that some subsets of Christian supersessionism can affirm that God has not annulled his everlasting covenant with the Jewish people, neither past nor present nor future. <inaudible> Islam and supersessionism The Islamic doctrine of Tarif in its canonical form teaches that Jewish and Christian scriptures or their interpretations have been corrupted, which has obscured the divine message that they originally contained. According to this doctrine, the Quran both points out and corrects errors introduced by previous corruption of monotheistic scriptures, which makes it the final and most pure divine revelation. Sandra Tony Keating argues that Islam was supersessionist from its inception, advocating the view that the Quranic revelations would replace the corrupted scriptures possessed by other communities, and that early Islamic scriptures display a clear theology of revelation that is concerned with establishing the credibility of the nascent community," vis-a-vis -vis other religions. In contrast, Abdulaziz Sashadina has argued that Islamic supersessionism stems not from the Quran or Hadith, but rather from the work of Muslim jurists who reinterpreted the Quranic message about Islam in its literal meaning of submission, being the only true religion with God into an argument about the religion of Islam being superior to other faiths, thereby providing theoretical justification for Muslim political dominance and a wider interpretation of the notion of jihad. Types Both Christian and Jewish theologians have identified different types of supersessionism in the Christian reading of the Bible. R. Kendall Solon notes three categories of supersessionism identified by Christian theologians, punitive, economic, and structural. Punitive supersessionism is represented by such Christian thinkers as Hippolytus, Origen, and Luther. It is the view that Jews who reject Jesus as the Jewish Messiah are consequently condemned by God, forfeiting the promises otherwise due to them under the covenants. Economic supersessionism is used in the technical theological sense of function see economic trinity. 
It is the view that the practical purpose of the nation of Israel in God's plan is replaced by the role of the Church. It is represented by writers such as Justin Martyr, Augustine, and Barth. Structural supersessionism is Solon's term for the de facto marginalization of the Old Testament as normative for Christian thought. In his words, structural supersessionism refers to the narrative logic of the standard model whereby it renders the Hebrew scriptures largely indecisive for shaping Christian convictions about how God's works as consummator and redeemer engage humankind in universal and enduring ways. Solon's terminology is used by Craig A. Blazing, in The Future of Israel as a Theological Question. These three views are neither mutually exclusive, nor logically dependent, and it is possible to hold all of them or any one with or without the others. The work of Matthew Tappy attempts a further clarification of the language of supersessionism in modern theology that Peter Ox has called the clearest teaching on supersessionism in modern scholarship. Tappy argued that Solon's view of economic supersessionism shares important similarities with those of Jules Isaac's thought, the French Jewish historian well known for his identification of the teaching of contempt in the Christian tradition, and can ultimately be traced to the medieval concept of the cessation of the law, the idea that Jewish observance of the ceremonial law. Law, Sabbath, circumcision, and dietary laws ceases to have a positive significance for Jews after the Passion of Christ. According to Solon, Christians today often repudiate supersessionism but they do not always carefully examine just what that is supposed to mean. Solon thinks Tappy's work is a remedy to this situation. Topic see also Abrogation of Old Covenant Laws Antinomianism Christian Anti-Judaism Christian Views on the Old Covenant Circumcision Controversy in Early Christianity Conversion of the Jews Tarif Topic Notes Topic Further reading Tappy, Matthew A. Aquinas on Israel and the Church, The Question of Supersessionism in the Theology of Thomas Aquinas. Pickwick, WIPF and Stock, 2014. First Chapter Vlock, Michael J. The Church as a Replacement of Israel, An Analysis of Supersessionism. Ph.D. Dissertation. Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, 2004. Content, 6pg.pdf, 1.chapter, 24pg.pdf Aguzzi, Stephen D. Israel, The Church, and Eschatological Hope, Moltmann's Millenarianism and the Jewish Catholic Question, Ph.D. Dissertation. Duquesne University, 2014. Charles D. Provon. The Church is Israel Now, The Transfer of Conditional Privilege. ISBN 978-1-879998-39-1 Supports Supersessionism Topic External links Michael Forrest and David Palm, All in the Family, Christians, Jews and God, Lay Witness Magazine, July-August, 2009. An article opposing extreme supersessionism and dual covenant theology. Why Catholics for Israel? An article by Catholics opposing supersessionism. Michael J. Vlock. Supersession Info Page Opposing Supersessionism. The Attacks of Replacement Theology Opposing Supersessionism Michael Knighton. False Gospel, Supersessionism Replacement Theology. Opposing Supersessionism. 